not to not not that I want to hype him up this much, but kind of like Mitch Covian, if you will, in the sense that he can kind of do Mitch anything. Oh yeah, I'm coining that. That's going on a T-shirt. You need to trademark that right off the gig. <laughs> All right, what is up, everybody? Welcome back here to Four Fly Guys, episode 17. Uh, we're getting along. We're talking along with the pod, and the Flyers are chugging along with the uh, choke train as they're uh, really blowing this season, and it's pretty much over at this point. Um, they're not mathematically done, not officially done. There's still three more games left, but it, 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 if there was anything that reminded me more of the Elaine Vigneault era, it would be that. Um my God, I mean, to to have such a promising season and have so many good moments and 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 have, you know, like again, we we talked about it on this pod. Like they get you know some real like good battling wins, like points against some really good teams, and then they go into a five game swing against Montreal, Chicago, the Islanders, Buffalo, and Columbus, and get absolutely curb stomped in just about all of those games. Uh, they have been outscored 42 to 18 uh, on the eight game winless streak. Um, since the March 23rd game against the Bruins, they've gotten two points uh, and they had four or five point advantages at that point on, on some teams that are right there with them right now, Washington, the Islanders. Um, it, it, it sucks. It sucks. I mean, there, there's really nothing else you can say outside of that. It sucks. Um, any, uh, any thoughts here, boys on, on just the entire collapse of, of this team? This is horrible. These games have been just miserable to watch. Um, last night's game especially is just unbelievable. Um, yeah, this, this team brutal, um, paying attention more to the draft now though, suddenly, suddenly have more of an interest in that and keep an eye out on some names I didn't think would be possible. So I guess that's kind of the uh, silver lining. But yeah, I don't number, know, Paul. Uh, yeah, number so, number 10 is looking real tasty right now, isn't it? Number it is. 10 is, is staring at them, staring at them from the, uh, from the bottom up because, I mean, you thought that you were going to draft probably somewhere in like the 20 range. You figured they would make the playoffs and then, uh, you know, maybe like 18, 19 if it was a lower, you know, earlier exit, but things have, have drastically taken a turn. And now you're looking at, all right, well, what, how could we get into the top 10? You know, it's just yeah. it, the ebbs and flows of the hockey season are unreal. And that's another one of those right there, like just completely flipped on its axis. This team right. was supposed to be something and then they overachieved and they were something else. Now they're back to, you know, oh, it's the Flyers, you know, they're collapsing, whatever. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just really kind of unexpected. I know, Sam, me and you were talking about this uh, before we started. A couple episodes ago, I said, you know, I, I don't really see a way that they don't make the playoffs, right? And you were like, I don't know, I think you're kind of playing with fire. Like, they're, they're not in until they're in, right? So, that's, you know, this is kind of one of those examples. So, what do you, what do you think, Sam? Yeah, that's exactly – I always – the whole season I said the we're not in until we're in kind of thing. And it's not like – I mean, it could have been anybody on our team. It could have been we, we could have been you know, going for the president's trophy or something like that. And I still would be like, well, if, as long as we're as long as we're uh, not mathematically in, I'm still like you know wary because it's just because I've I've seen this story before. Like I know how it goes, and I'm sure like every fan base, no matter like no matter who they are, always says like you know nothing ever goes our way. But like I just know I just know how it goes. And th- and then and then when you get to this point in the season, is when like teams are really like your true colors really show and you, that separation really starts to happen. Whereas if, if you're ready to go into the playoffs then you're ready to go in and then if, even if you were a little bit out, you know, you make that push, but it seems like nobody in our division, including us really wanted to make that push and we yeah. kind of left the door open a little too long. Yeah. And, 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 and just to kind of, you know, add on to that, the, the, the there's obviously been a lot of talk of if torts is gone. And if they've quit on torts, there's a tweet that just came out from Darren Dreger. He said, we can all pre- appreciate the speculation. And when it comes to John Tortorella and the stories that follow, there's always speculate, speculation. As for his future as head coach, a Flyers management source says, quote, unquote, torts is not leaving the bench. He still has the fire. No question about that. Uh, so it doesn't seem like they're parting ways. 
uh, with Torts or he's not leaving the bench going upstairs. Um, we've reported some stuff before on on the possibility, um, or not even really the possibility, just the idea that you know Craig Burby could be somehow part of it. Um, we know he's been at the games and he's been in Philly since he's been let go by St. Louis. Just keep tabs on that. But yeah, no, I mean just just to just to add, I mean, I personally I've watched this team since uh 12, 13. Um, there's been some good moments. Obviously, there's been some 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 fun years, but to have a, a season to be, have such a good year like this, especially with what, everything that we're doing too, like um, it would have been really nice to end the year with you know our first year of the company and doing this podcast and and everything to have some playoff games to go with it. Um, and 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 it sucks. I mean, for for the team, it's like you know I I just I don't get the same vibe anymore when i'm watching like it feels it's like all right you know they, they might lose tonight but they're still kind of in it you know what i mean like i just i haven't gotten that vibe in the past like maybe week and a half two weeks um it, it, it's brutal it really is i mean they, they went from third they dropped the sixth um they're basically done in the wild card if you're looking at standings and things like that uh standings wise it's it's getting tighter and the flyers aren't making it any easier on themselves. They have 79 games played again, three games left, uh, 83 points. Uh, there are only two points back, uh, of the second wild card spot. They're only four points back of the Islanders. Uh, but again, they have more games played. They haven't gotten any points and they don't look like they're going to be really winning any of these games any soon. Uh, any, uh, any thoughts last night on the, uh, Canadians game, the, uh, nine, three debacle that was, I mean, I've, I turned it off eventually. Yeah, yeah. It's good. I've, I've, I've never anymore. seen, I've never seen a game where it just looks like the entire team is so mentally checked out, and, and it looked like that from the start of the second period. I, I feel like they came out with, you know, I mean, the first period I thought that they played better offensively compared to the the games before, at least against you know Columbus, Buffalo. I thought they were better offensively. I think they had a little bit more opportunity with their chances. Um, it was another one of those situations, though, just like, you know, maybe they outshot Montreal on the board. But if you look at the quality of those chances, those shots, it was, you know, next to nothing. They were just little floaters from the blue line that, you know, had almost no harm at, at Montembeau. So it was just, you know, another one of those games where you're like, all right, well, you know, here we go. Just waiting for something to happen. And the defense was embarrassing. I mean, Drysdale, I think, was a minus six. That's, I That's mean. Bad. That's, That's awful. That's it's yeah. So, and you know, his partner, obviously just with the amount of numbers they were getting scored on there, you let up six goals. I mean, Sealer was a minus five. Um, so it's that pairing alone was just not cutting it. And on top of that, you have a team with already shattered confidence. It's just wasn't a good combination. They got embarrassed, showed essentially no heart really. I mean, you'd like to see some sort of fight there. Um, it just wasn't there. I mean, even with Farabee and Paling, Paling in a two-goal game, Farabee and Paling, obviously you're not going to celebrate. Yeah, nobody cares because they. Yeah. It, it seemed like they didn't even want to score for for most of the game. I, I, finally... I, I, mean, I, I think with me, like the way that I look at this, it's like there isn't one person you can blame the song. It's a collective group. It's a collective team. It's, yeah, it's a collective it's a unit. Yeah, like you can't just say it's oh, it's only on Tortorella or it's only on the players or it's only on management or whatever. It's on everyone. Um, but I will say, I mean, I think there were some, you know, head scratching decisions lineup wise. Um I didn't I like still, that Jennings was out. Yeah, and, and it's things like that. It's like you're putting Stahl and Johnson, who not that I don't like those guys as players, but they 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 just can't skate anymore. And you know, I, I think when you look at just where the where the team was at, and it was just like, it, it was just like the same, like the same lineup that clearly wasn't cutting it, and there wasn't much change to it. The only really changes were like, like Lixol would maybe come out or switch a line or whatever. Like, he like there wasn't much of a, of a spark to do anything. And like I, I mean, you, you look at the timeout last night. He calls a timeout. It's three nothing. Like all right, he's on the bench. And no, and no one says anything. Like there's there's not a word like uttered from that bench at all. I mean, you can go and watch it. Like they might say some things, but it it seemed like it was all like 
like lineup decision. Like it, it like he tapped like towards like tapped Coots back and it was like, all right, you go. And I think they were trying to just figure out who was going. And I'm thinking to myself, like, how do you not sit there with four games left in the middle of a playoff race, trying to get in, trying to crawl your way in? If do you just let this entire thing slip and not even try to spark your team up? It's like I get it. You could say, like, yeah, you know, that you know, I know Torts has said like, you know, he doesn't really have to say anything. But when does that like interfere? What, what when do we get like they've lost fucking seven in a row already? So why are we still at the point where it's like, oh well, I, I shouldn't say anything because they know how to do it. Clearly, they don't if they're they've just lost seven games. Not saying that they're they're not capable of doing that, but like again, it's just how do you how do you how do you call a timeout in the worst Literally, literally the worst time to be losing some of these games and not say anything and then not try to spark your team up. Like, and look, I'm not saying it has to be like Peter Laviolette in game seven against the Bruins when it was three not in the first period. No, yeah. but I mean, you at least have to say something, that is my thing. It's like because the whole thing with Torts has been like, you know, he's the guy that that pumps them up, but he gets them all, you know, excited. And I think everyone knew this as soon as they got to the playoffs and if they did get there. There was going to be cameras inside that room and everyone was going to be all pumped up and he was going to be pumping them up and everything like that. That's all it would have been, right? And and, and not saying that that's a bad thing, but we didn't we haven't seen any of that in towards his tenure as, as a flyer. Um as far as coach. So that's my gripe with with Torts. Um and I think on the players, I mean honestly, if you told me a guy, I'd probably tell you that pretty much all of them disappeared. Um, Faraby had a goal last night, his first goal since March 16th. Yeah. Uh, Tippett, I don't think I've seen one positive play from Tippett in, in maybe eight, nine games. Other than uh, his little kind of after the play scrums, I think connect has been pretty invisible since he set his new career. Yeah, I, I think everyone's fighting it. Like Lawton, I don't, I haven't seen much. Coots, we've talked about Couturier. Um, I mean, even the line that they were saying that was like going well was the paling Hathaway and, and it was Forrester a little bit. And then they would put, um, obviously they, they just put Lixel on it. Even that line looked quiet. I mean, everything just looked quiet. It was just like, it felt like last night there was a lot of like, like the first couple plays of the game, they had the high flip and that was working. And they had a couple of chances off of that. Then, then the defense would either do the, keep doing the high flip or just pass it out of the zone. And that looked like that was confusing everybody because they would do the high flip and no one would go get it. Like there was there was one play, someone flipped it out, and I think it might have been Johnson or Stahl. And Couturier and Tippett were both standing maybe like three not even three feet apart from each other, just in the uh in the neutral zone. But and no one went to it. And I'm like, all right, like what are we doing here? Like, are we doing the high flip or are we just trying to move it out of the zone? You know what I mean? So it, like they just look so discombobulated and then I don't know. I mean, and, and again, I'm I'm just asking the question. I, I don't I don't think I agree with it. But do you guys think that they've kind of quit on Tortorella, or there's any sort of maybe he lost the room a little bit? Is that something that that you guys think or no? I think when you have a coach that's the style of Tortorella, where he's just kind of like constantly in your face, you know, like accountability, preaching that kind of game. I think there's a certain point in the year, um, naturally, but especially with younger guys who are like kind of coming up. I think there's a certain point where you start to just kind of put your head down and maybe a little bit tune out what he says. Um, I think for better or for worse, obviously, and I think last night shows you the worst part of it. I think it looked like a team that just kind of went out there and didn't really um, have any, I guess, will to make the playoffs. And uh you know, it didn't really seem like that Tortorella was the guy who was who they wanted to be leading. I could be way off, but I mean, it just seems like right now they're kind of just over torts. And I don't think it's necessarily like a long term thing. I'm not saying he's going to get fired. I just think at this point in the year, I think they're a little fed up with it. They've you know been battling it injury wise. I think they're just kind of over it. And, you know, last night you saw the uh, the effects of that. What do you what do you think, Sam? Well, I have a hard time believing that, like especially for the veterans that that they would throw away a season on a playoff chance <clears throat> just because they don't like the coach or something like that. I mean, I, if, I, I think that like maybe just at this point, it's just kind of showing that like maybe this was the team that we might've been the whole entire year. 
and for some reason it just worked and we got hot at certain points and now it's just like now that it's crunch time it's you know like other teams other teams don't have to play 100 percent. like they, they have good enough players and they can rely on skill to get them through you know the, the chunk of the season like that we had to go you know full balls to the wall pretty much to get to where we are and even have a shot at this thing and i think that it might now be catching up with us i mean he said like they look tired i don't know if they actually are tired or if, if it's more of a mental thing, but I don't know. I mean, like it, it's weird with me because I, I feel differently. I think part of it is they played as hard as they could for most of the season to try to yeah. salvage what they had. And again, I'm not in the room. I'm not going to sit here and make assumptions of, of, you know, them. That's what up. I mean. I, we're not in the room. I, don't, I can't really say anything. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think you can though. Like, I, well, I well, no, I mean, like we can't say anything for like a like a matter of fact. You know. Right. Right. Exactly. I do think there is some weight to the conversation of them tuning them out because I do think in the most important part of the season, you know, Torts is, is kind of the guy that can is he the coach is the one who gets them ready. The players have to do the rest. I don't necessarily think he's gotten them ready. I, I don't think that's that's true. And I think when you look at some of these games, you can say the same thing. And I that's think something that he's talked about, though. He, he's talked about that in yeah. his media availability. He said that right. he feels like he hasn't done the best job mm-hmm. at getting them ready for these games. So yeah. But at the I, same I time, is he, is he genuinely saying that? Or is he only saying that because he called them soft a couple weeks ago? I mean, I, I don't know. You know why I, mean? I feel like a lot of the whole, like, I didn't get them ready. I didn't do this and all this stuff. It's kind of just like him covering up for himself after he called them soft against the Islanders. I don't, when let alone honest, one of the guys who he's had a gripe with his entire time in Philly scored the biggest fucking goal of their season up until that point. I mean, I don't think he's. It, it's just. Uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, no, I don't. I don't think he's Tortorella's John Tortorella. When you think about that guy and everything that he has done throughout his coaching career. I don't think he's the guy that's just going to make a PR statement and say something for the sake of like making up for something he already said. That's not I the vibe that I get from Torres. He does, really. Yeah, I think okay. he would do something like that, I mean, but not for the PR angle. I think he would do something like, "Hey, like, like, basically, like, well, no, like, like, hey, like, I was unfair to these guys last week. Like, I need to go back and kind of like fix my wrong statement." I don't think he's thinking about it from the PR angle. I think he genuinely cares about his team. And yeah. he's he's like, you know what? Like, I was too hard. On the, like, just this, the thing with um Felix Sandstrom, where he, like, yeah. afterwards, he was like, he was like, yeah. you know what? That, that was unfair to me. Like, I shouldn't have. Like, I think he just reacted emotionally the first time. And the second time was him kind of going back on that and fixing the fact that he reacted in an emotional way that was unfair. Yeah, I don't I think mean, he's I, doing it for like a PR purpose or like manipulative. Yeah. I think that's genuine like, to who he is. That's more right. of a public I, apology. I feel like, yeah, and yeah. I feel like with me, like that's those are two different things. Like, like, like saying that a player like can't play or I mean, like, like embarrassing a player is one thing specifically, like, and then versus embarrassing your team. And I right. feel like when you're embarrassing a player, yeah, you're probably going to get some heat for that. I mean, but Torts has always been a guy that embarrasses a player. So that's why it came to me weird, like with the whole like I apologize to Sandstrom thing, because it was like he's done this his entire coaching career. Like he did this with Couturier, he did this with Frost, he did this with Sanheim, he did this with Brink. Like when he you, when you sit a guy in that sort of situation, and we talked about this before. I mean, Christ, he said Frost is up and down like a toilet seat. Like who wants to be compared to something you sit your ass on? Like. It's just things like that that I'm just like I don't get the whole, you know, apology thing, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm my, my thoughts on on torts are way different, I think, than everyone else's. Definitely. Um, yeah. Yeah, and 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 I, and I think when you look at oh, kind of just, I, th- I look, it's just it's frustrating to me. It's just like I just don't understand how you preach accountability and all these things, and then the most important part of your season, you just it, it just goes away. It's like how how do we not finish like i just don't get it like how do you have such a promising season and then just it's like you just can't get over the finish line it's like 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 god it it it, it, i don't know it just no it's uh, it's a legit question yeah it's just i'm just at a loss for words like i don't i don't understand how you had such a fucking good promising year and it just it went away 
I, I just yeah, I don't I mean, get it. It's a legit question, and it's something that needs to be asked, especially because, and going back to the whole, the you know, kind of torch statement on on Sandstrom, and then the what we were talking about the PR kind of response. I think the Sandstrom apology was different because that was a direct, not necessarily an attack, but like you know, it, it was a bad look all around. So like. It was essentially just targeted at one guy in specific. That's the type of thing he takes account accountability for. Sure, I understand that. But with saying like, oh, you know, I don't think I got them ready enough. That's a whole different statement. That's completely different. I think it's just more like whether he means it or not, it's it's totally different. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, it is true. I think he's clearly, I think he had them prepared to be the underdogs that were proving everybody wrong. And then when it came time to actually solidify that and make your way into the playoffs now that you have it and you're sitting there, it's right in your hands. I don't think they were ready and prepared for that. And I th- I do think that a good chunk of that is the coach's fault, but at the same time, the players have to step up and they just haven't. So um, the one thing I didn't like about last night's game was that you decide to scratch Adam Jennings the game after he scores his first NHL goal in a game that you get blown out six two by the bottom five blue jackets. I don't understand that. I, I don't, I really don't like that, but you know, I mean, that's just kind of a me thing. I think Jenning has played very well since his recall. And I think that if you score your first NHL goal, then, you know, I don't know why you're sat the next game. I, I, I personally feel like when you look at a lot of the decisions with the roster, a lot of them never made sense. Like it felt like a guy was playing well and then the next minute he was out or whatever, but um, we got to take a hard stop. And uh, we'll be right back. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick intermission here to introduce a special guest to the podcast this week. One of our many talented writers for Mayor Media Co., Nick Roche. All right. Thank you, Producer Owen. We're back. Uh, and we have Nick. Uh, Nick's one of our really good writers. Uh, he does a lot of good stuff with us. Um, really talented, really good dude. What's up, buddy? Uh, Debut not episode. much. Thank you guys for having me today. I'm really excited to be here and be on the pod. There yeah. you go. Yeah, it's great having you. We kicked off Sam for you. So yeah, you know, <laughs> <it's up. Okay. laughs> yeah, yeah. You got the pleasure of not seeing uh, Sam's ugly mug as we uh, kind of uh, go on. I think here. I got the displeasure of not seeing Sam's beautiful face here. Come on, oh, man. <laughs> uh, he doesn't. He doesn't need more. He doesn't need more hype. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's kind of get into into the rest of this here. So uh we were just talking about tortorella a little bit nick i'll I'll, I'll ask you about that before we kind of um segue into the rest uh basically the comment of you know did did has torts lost the room a little bit do you think he's kind of lost the room a little bit is like is there anything that you think there or no see like that that's been the question over the last like eight games is have they quit on torts like i think obviously the scratching of katari a few weeks ago like that didn't help that didn't do him any favors in the locker room I think they've kind of been a little standoffish with them since that. There, there's a clear disconnect, I think, between the coaching staff and the players themselves. I don't know if it's necessarily Torts has lost the room or if the team is just, I, I think, like, they're, they're just gassed. Like, it, it's clear they can't keep up. They're not playing as sharply as they should be and as they were at the start of the season. Mm-hmm. But in saying that as well, like, I think it, does come down to torts to get them fired up and get them back on task with three games left rangers jersey and the capitals i think there's no time left and like playoff push time's running out for that and it doesn't look likely at this point and i think if you go out with a whimper instead of a bang i think that's more of a criticism on your coaching staff than it is on your players and there's winnable games, Washington and Jersey. Jersey's without Jack Hughes now for the rest of the season. Um, so it's not like those aren't winnable games. And they can hang with the Rangers. They, they've shown that. But are they going to? Can yeah. they do it? Do they still have the ability to do it? And is Torts going to do what he needs to do to get them there? I don't know if it's him necessarily losing the room or if it's, it's the players quitting on the season. But something is up with the coaching staff and the players and there's a clear disconnect and I suppose we'll find out after the after the season's over maybe what yeah I think the Couturier situation was actually you know it's a good point there because uh it's pretty clear that since 
the Kateri is scratching. I mean, that's not going to send a great message to the room when you sit your captain two games. And, you know, he, he, before that, he'd been demoted to the fourth line. So, right. and he's played pretty much played there ever since. I think he's, you know, he's been bumped up a little bit recently since uh, right before his injury. And then now when he came back against Montreal. But, you know, it's just, it is interesting. And I think that the disconnect is real. I don't know how, how harsh that disconnect is. I think it could escalate to something more over the over the you know next few games and and maybe the off season but i think right now it's just about kind of they've i feel like they've hit a wall it, it feels like they've hit a wall with tours i don't know if they've hit the ceiling i do think they've hit a wall though and um you know i i think going forward that's something you need to evaluate is it the players that are you know maybe wearing most of the responsibility is it the coach or is it just a clear disconnect and a combination of both with maybe you've you know kind of met your match with the situation you're in right now uh that's something that they're going to have to look at and if they feel like maybe they've you know kind of reached their ceiling with Tortorella as the coach of this team we'll see what happens but you know Dreger's report today kind of indicates that there probably isn't going to be much movement as far as uh Tortorella leaving the bench here so yeah yeah does anyone think that there should be movement with Rocky Thompson a hundred percent. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how you couldn't. Yeah, you know, special teams, especially at this stage in the season, are make or break moments. Like you need your special teams to be able to perform this late in the season, and if you want to be in the playoffs, having a somewhat yep. decent power play can go a very long way in the postseason and throughout the season as well. Like they get power play chances, but for what? They get one or two chances per two or three power plays. Right. And it's cost them games. It's cost them a lot of games this season, actually. And something's got to change behind the bench when it comes to the power play coaching. Yeah, definitely. So I had a tweet up uh, yesterday morning. And I kind of went through a lot of, of some of the stats with the power play. And the more I look at it, the more aggravated it, it makes me. But I think... Uh, when I here it is, so I, I I just I don't understand the idea of the high, like I, I I didn't understand it then, and I was like, all right, let me give this a chance, and now I still don't understand it. And if they do nothing, then honestly, it's shame on them. Uh, that if if they do nothing with the power play coach, that's the first thing in my mind that Briere and Jones have done wrong. Uh, so just for the last four years, right. The shortened COVID season, 19.5%. Middle of the league, it was 17th in the NHL. That's fine. Um, not great, not, you know, not horrible, uh, but obviously some some room to improve. Um, and that's that was with Michelle Tarion. 2020, 2020, uh, just, just sorry, 2021-22, this is the first year of this kind of whole, you know, let's rebuild kind of thing. 12.6%, 32nd in the NHL. Then Rocky comes in, who previously – in when when the Flyers had the nineteen point five percent, he had a fourteen point one percent with San Jose. Granted, it is San Jose um, and twenty ninth ranked. So he comes in. So they, they they're hiring a guy who doesn't have a ton of experience and only you know one showing. So maybe they think that that can change. Two years in a row, thirty second in the league. Last year, fifteen point six percent. This season, twelve point seven. I mean, you're you're in in two of the last three seasons. You're gonna have some of your worst power play percentages of all time. It's like, how do you not make a change there? And I I'm sorry, I don't believe the idea that the, the, their power play is bad because they don't have enough talent. That that's not true. That is not true. They can play five on five, but they can't play three on three, five on four, or or four on four. That's pretty clear. I mean, we've shown it in many games this year. Those are some of the areas that I think for next year have to be better. Like the power I think play it's a mix, has, though. Has to be. I, th- I think it's a mix, though, because with you what? don't have with the talent and the coaching, because you do have yeah, talent, sure. but you don't have any. Yeah. You still don't have the guy. You still don't have the guy who can no, just but, you know score whenever but, he wants. Oh, okay, let's be honest. They have a much better roster to be the last fucking power play in the NHL. Yeah, one hundred percent. So, and that's where the coaching and falls. Be mid twenties. Right. You and know that's what where, mean? That's where like, the coaching falls right there. There's no yeah. reason, even with the talent they have, that it should be the like, last even ranked last power play night, in the league. Like I'm, I'm watching that first power play, and just like the place – I've said this all year. Like the placement of guys makes no sense to me. Like you have like, – you have Drysdale, Konechny, 
Tippett, Frost, and Brink on the same unit. You have multiples of two of two players on the same unit. You have Tippett and Kenakney who can both who both should be on the wall on the on the left flank, and you have Frost and Brink who could both be on on the flank. So that leaves your net front and your bumper guy as who. Not saying that those guys can't play bumper in in a situation, but when you need wins and shit, like I, it's just like you're putting guys out there in spots that just don't work. I'm tired of the same like the same handness on the same wall where Brink is on the right side. There's no room doing that. None. Absolutely none. When I talked with, with Jake Vorchek in October, he explained it to me in such a way where it's like you literally only have so much time. And the idea is that if you zip it around fast, that is how you score. And the Flyers have not zipped it around fast since guys like Jake, guys like Simmons, guys like G were running the power play all the time. And they had guys spread the point who could blast away. And it's, yeah. and it's like when you're passing to a guy who is on the backhand, you have less time to retrieve it and vice versa. If you're on the forehand, you have more time. So it's just simple things like that. It's like, why are we doing this? We, we saw a power play where for so many years was one of the best top five in the league and zipping it around, have the guys in the right spot, one timer, pass at the side of the net, whatever. But yes, you know, they, they, they had high end, some high end talent on that. They don't have that. But they also don't have a power play that should be worse than the NHL. Like you have Forrester, yeah. you have Tippett, you have Faraby, you have Connecty. Those all four of those guys right there can shoot. You have Drysdale, you have York. That's two power play quarterbacks, and you have Sanheim who can do it too in a pinch. And Zamula. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's just mind boggling to me how you you still have this the worst power play in the NHL. I just I don't I just don't get it. I don't think the only thing I think considered a quarterback though. I mean, I'm, well, I'm saying he can play it. I'm not saying he's good at it. I'm saying he can do it. Right, yeah. but that's I think that's where the issue is, though, is you have the coaching staff that's already – or not staff, but, you know, the power play unit that they have coaching and in charge of it, Rocky Thompson especially. It's – you don't have the talent, like the high-end talent, to be able to be one of the top power plays in the league. But like you said, at least don't be at the, you know, the, the basement yeah. of the league. I mean, it's, and to be there three years in a row, it's just like you, right. you can't it's not make not a decision. Enough. that. Yeah, like you can't, yeah. you just can't. Like it, it, it would just be too stupid to sit right, there and yeah. say, oh, no, we're going to keep going with Rocky. And not saying that, yeah. like, even if they did, I still think it's a problem. And, and look, at the same time, I don't want to see a guy get fired. Like that that's that's the yeah. worst situation because it means you're – like someone getting fired means you have to restart. And, and we've restarted right. way too much more than I could – you know, really want to count or admit to. So like, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's just, it's frustrating with the power play. I know that wasn't on the notes, but I figured we should mention it. because. Can, it was- can I jump in and ask you guys a quick question? Yeah. yeah. Would you rather have a power play unit with Owen Tippett, Morgan Frost, and Travis Konechny, or one with Clayton Keller, Nick Schmaltz, and Alex Kerfoot? Yeah, I mean, on paper, Arizona is definitely... I'd say there's just definitely a step down, but for some reason they seem to figure it out. Arizona's power play is 12th in the league, 22.3%. Yeah. There is no reason the Flyers should be that much worse than Arizona. I agree. Yeah, but I do think the Coyotes, the Coyotes have some good elements to it. Yeah, yeah. they do. Thank you, producer Owen. Yeah. Thank that you. Was, That's uh, a good point. Yeah. Good job, Owen. It's good. Hell yeah. There you go. Oh, and getting his cookies. All right. All right. Let's move on. Uh, the fly guy is no one. That's why it's a blank space. Um, no one deserved it, uh, honestly. I mean, there, there was no one who was that fly enough through this uh, to make us choose a specific thing. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the more I look at that headshot, it kind of looks like Martin Jones a little bit. But anyway. <laughs> Um, we could have given know. it to uh, we could have given it to Ivan Fedotov's mask, maybe. That's a good one. That mask is sweet. Right Fedotov's mask yeah. has been the week's MVP. Yeah. That mask yeah. is unreal. That you know what's funny? Fe- the Phoenix, dude. I, 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 I wonder, that, I wonder I if think it's the best. Something to do with that? I don't know. Wait, I, mean, I think it's has the it. best goalie mask in the league. Yeah, I, I'd go as far to say it's the best one. It's up there for sure. I yeah. was a big fan of Cal Peterson's white one that he revealed you know who when he came over here. Yeah, I like that one too. That was sick. You know, it's funny. When I was watching that game last night, you know who he reminded me of in that? Hmm. Nittimaki. Because Nitty always had the orange around the side and then the black at the top. Yeah. 
So yeah. I started thinking, I'm like, oh my god, it reminds me of Nitty a little bit, like the way he's moving. I, I didn't notice. Did he? Uh, did he get new pads? I don't think so. I think he just got no, a mask. He didn't. Just, just the yeah, bucket, just, yeah. Just the mask, yeah. He's probably gonna have all new pads for next year. Yeah, um, like you know how sick it would be. You know how sick it would be if he had like, like a phoenix pattern on the pads to match the helmet. Dude, that would be that'd dope. Be that would be sick. That'd, that'd be so yeah, nasty. I know. I know the Flyers love white pads. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know Dillabo yeah. loves white pads and really doesn't like black pads. Yeah, um, one day, one day, I would really like to see somebody bring back the old, uh, like the the brown leather Brzezgalov pads. Oh, I would love mm-hmm. to see those for the Winter Classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was hoping Urson would have did something like that for the Stadium Series, but well, Briz didn't play in the yeah. Winter Classic, but yeah, right, so, yeah. But I think, but, but yeah. Bob had them too, didn't he? Yeah, I, yeah. Uh, no, I don't think he wore them in the Winter Classic, did he? Oh, I don't know. I don't remember. I'm not sure. I know um, he, he, Briz wore them a lot though in 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I did like that mask. That was sweet. Um. But yeah, I mean, for for a fly guy, it's like it's like who can you pick? You know, like there is no, there is really like no one really stepped up. Like there was no like it just it has to be no one. Honestly, I think yeah. we'd be too. I think we'd be too. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of here? I think you'd be uh, settling if you if you chose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we just like chose a guy, you know what I mean? We we kind of just be yeah. like you know, throw it would throw cheapen throw it the, the next the next week or whenever the yeah. next. Time it gets someone, it would cheapen it yeah, if right. we gave it to someone this week. Right, yeah, exactly. exactly, exactly. Um, so Flyers, j- just to kind of look ahead of the draft a little bit, Flyers currently hold the twelfth pick. Uh, Will, I'll start with you here since you're a big prospect guy. Any any guys you're you're maybe looking out on your board or or anything like that around maybe twelve, ten ish, maybe thirteen. Yeah. Um. So my kind of thing is. And we saw this last year, specifically with Zach Benson, right? Mm-hmm. Guys fall. I had Zach Benson ranked fifth in my list uh, ahead of Will Smith, and he fell to 13th. You know, like that, those falls happen. The four guys that I'd be looking at that have potential, I think, to fall and would be like a great value pick in that like sort of 10 to 12 range that I think we might land at. Um, I would say it's one of four guys. I would go uh, Zeev Booyam, Zane Parekh, Berkeley Catton, and um, crap, Paul, help me out here. Oh, oh, and um, Cole Eiserman. That's it. Cole Eiserman. Um, Yeah. That's um, one of those four, if not two of those four, I think are very likely to fall um and be available for us that could be a huge and any one of those four could be a huge pickup um eiserman is seeming more and more likely to be definitely there that's what i was going to say eiserman i think could be the benson of this draft yeah although in my opinion though i I would i would more compare um berkeley catton to okay. the Benson of this draft. I haven't looked at I anyone. Mean, so I'm curious what yeah. you can be. Yeah. Berkeley Catton genuinely might be the best player I've seen from the WHL outside of Bedard in the last couple of seasons. Um, but he's a bit smaller. Not not Benson small. I believe Benson's like five eight, five nine. Mm-hmm. Um Catton's a bit taller, but probably a bit skinnier as well. But Catton just plays just such a unique game, like high skill, playmaking, kind of not to not not that I want to hype him up this much, but kind of like Mitch Covian, if you will, in the sense that he can kind of do Mitch anything. Oh yeah, I'm pointing that. That's going on a t-shirt. You need to. You can right kind of right you can kind of like adapt to any play style. I think that's I feel the like <laughs> Yeah, so Berkeley Cat would be my pick. I don't know that he falls that far. I think he yeah, more falls slight. to a seven or an eight. Yeah, um, the, the Flyers had two picks out of the out of the uh, W last year as well. Yeah, right. Um, Bjornsson and uh, Southern. And yeah, and two two out of the OHL as well. So, yeah, um, speaking of Southern, dude's been dude's been nasty. Kind of on a tear. Playoffs. Yeah, so far. yeah. 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 It's kind of gross. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so yeah, so when, interesting things to look forward to at the draft for sure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. We'll, just, we'll, just to round that out too, we'll have a lot of coverage on Pipeline. Um, PHI Pipeline, that's our, our prospect draft kind of whole brand uh, covering the Flyers. So stay tuned for that, and we'll have some more Phantoms coverage. And, and Phantoms are, are even in the playoff spot too, so we can maybe yeah. talk about that a little bit as well. Phantoms will definitely so, be going to the playoffs. I'll ask you, I'll ask you this. With the two first round picks the Flyers have this year, mm-hmm. would you be more inclined to package that with somebody else and try to move up in the draft? Or would you just kind of sit on your hands and take your picks where they are at? I think at this stage of, of not only where they're at in the rebuild, but what they need organizationally, I think that you have to trade up. I don't think there's any reason that they wouldn't. Sure, you have a Florida first that you've gotten from the Drew trade. That trade is the it's the deal that keeps on giving. It got you Tippett, it got you Barky. If you can use that pick to trade up and get another guy who's going to be an elite player here for years, that's an absolute monster deal from the Chuck Fletcher. Yeah, and, and, and honestly, the only way that I'm trading those two firsts is if it's in the top three. Yeah. Because two yeah, firsts I mean, in this draft, anything outside of three is is dumb. Yeah, I mean, I, you would have to package a guy that has serious value if you want to trade into the top three, especially if the Flyers are going to be picking from, you know, maybe the 10 to 12 range. Um, like if they have like 10 and 22, mm-hmm. and then you just trade, say say it's it, it, for at least at least three in my mind, at least. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to take a Panthers collapse in the playoffs for, for the pick to be that high, but uh, hopefully, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, well, no, I was, well, I was just saying like. For, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I do think that, you know, the elite high end talent is what they need right now. And that's, you have the box, you have the, you know, the, the mid first round picks, the foresters that are going to fill out your middle six, bottom six. What you need right now, especially is a first line center. And unfortunately yeah. this isn't really the draft to get it outside of Celebrini, but you can still get those elite talents that maybe you can transition some guy into a center. Frost can play center. Lawton can play center. I thought, have... I thought they're going to try with Mishkov, but. Yeah, you can I mean, even try Mitchkov at center. Before. He played yeah. a couple games there in, in Russia, so he it mm-hmm. wouldn't be surprising if they tried him at center either. It, it just makes but, too much sense not to. Because right, there's not you, much you have to translate with his game well, over. I, I mean, I don't know. I think we had a whole debate about this a few we did. episodes ago. But I, it, I don't it, agree it, with it's that, just, but. just Yeah, it, it just makes too much sense not to. Like, yeah. he, he has so much skill, and the Flyers are going to try to want to max out the skill as much as possible. Like, it, yeah. ju- it just makes too much sense. Not yeah. saying that like just because them doing that is going to make them like a, a two way guy. It's not. It's just if you can get them to play at the the better position, which is center, then you try it. If it doesn't work, put him at wing. I mean, it's not like you know. Yeah. I think by the time he's here, we might have another you know one or two guys. And who's to say they also couldn't maybe trade for a guy like you're saying too, Paul? Like if it's like a they could a first line type could. of center guy. Like one guy that I've thought about was Natchez. Like, I really wonder – because Carolina has a ton of free agents. I know Natchez I is really a, I wonder, believe, an RFA, so you could offer sheet him. And so is yeah. Jarvis. So, like, I, I'm not saying that, you know, they're going to go for every, you know, swing. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I think you, st- I think you still have to balance, you know, if free agents want to come here. And I also do think you have to balance, you know, would they have interest in playing in Philly. Um, right. And I think, you know, organizationally a lot of stuff has changed. Um, but obviously with the coach, it, it, it seems a little bit different. So I don't know. But anyway, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. Yeah, no, I mean, it, yeah, I think uh, – and going back to Mishkov, I, I'm not in favor of putting him at center because I don't think that's the type of style that matches his game. But for, for a game or two, I'm fine with trying it out. If it doesn't work, like you said, put him back at wing. I just don't want to mold him into, a, into something he's not because that's been one of the Flyers' biggest issues for the past decade and a half is trying to make – players something that they're not i mean you know yeah. they we saw what they did with adderd and how badly it messed up his development and now you know he's kind of struggling to hit the net but um, i feel like that's different though it's well it's different when you're trying to take an element of a guy's game and then like make him right, better but it depends on i just feel like it depends on like the type of player he is well of course yeah. it's i mean like adderd adderd's a, adderd was a what a fourth round pick i think off the top of my head, fourth or fifth, yeah, yeah. Like Mitchkov is a generational talent. It, it's two completely different conversations. Yeah. No, like, I, I yeah. just feel like again, like when I'm like, if I look at them and I'm like, you know, if they have a you know specific way that they want to do this, I'm sure they're probably have already been conversations of let's try them at center. Like, it, right, it just yeah. makes too much sense to me. It's it's kind of the same thing with Lindros. Like when they had Lindros and they got him, it was like, all right, well he's wing. 
try him and say, well, I, th- I think Lindros was wing. I don't want to say Lindros wasn't wing before. Yeah. I, I know he ended up playing center, but anyway, yeah, and, continue. And I, I, didn't wanna, I didn't want to fuck that up. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no. And I wasn't trying to like compare Mitchkov and Adder as players or as like, you yeah, know, no, how no, they're no, handling no. their development. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, no, not, not how they're handling the development. Just kind of like, you know, making a guy something he's not. That's what I would ideally, you know, you'd like to see them avoid. But as far as trading up, you need the talent because especially with Goche walking to Anaheim now, Drysdale is that talent on the back end, sure. But we saw last night he was a minus six. He's still got a long ways to go, and there's a chance that with the injury issues, he might not even pan out. You need – it's never an issue to have too many good players. Look at Anaheim, mm-hmm. Carlson, Gauthier, Zegris. Um, I wonder if it's Leno. Their defense is nasty. Zellweger. Zellweger is nasty. Mitchikov, yeah, yeah. they're they're deep. No, Mitchikov, not Mitchikov. I said Mitchikov. <laughs> I could have sworn he said Mitchikov. No, it's okay. Um, All right, but yeah, uh, Lucas they're stall. Yeah. They, they're, they're stacked. Yeah, Anaheim yeah. is stacked for the future, and, yeah, and that's good for a long time. You can never have too many talented players within your Oregon. And Flyers they have Terry home. too, still. So he's younger, right? And Terry's still young enough. Yeah, and, and the Flyers just need maybe not. You're not going to get to that level of that many stack prospects right now because you're just too far away from that but i think you can get to a, a point where you have enough to be able to contend and and be a successful team for a long time right now mm-hmm. they're just missing that guy in my opinion and i don't know who would be in this draft you're not going to get celebrini you're not going to get Demidov. i don't know who they're going to get but they would i'd like to see them try something and take a big swing yeah. yeah can i be honest i don't think i would want them to trade up i really I, I feel don't like either. the cost, I think the cost of moving up to the top three, or I would even say like, like, okay, the names that I would say would be valuable for them to trade into the top three, I would go Celebrini, well, I, I would say four, Celebrini, um, Demidov, uh, and then Booyam and um, Catton. Those would be the guys that, not that, not that the they would four. need to trade well, yeah, I mean, okay, they wouldn't need to trade into the top four to get Catton and, or really any of those last three I mentioned, but those would be the guys that I think, like, are top four-ish talents. Mm-hmm. The cost to move that high in the draft, I don't think is worth it, right? So then my that, question becomes... Yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying, too. Like, I don't yeah. think the cost is worth it, either. Yeah, exactly. And then the cost. what I could see them doing, and what I could, the only way I could get behind this Say they have some sort of intel that, like, Booyam, Perek, um, Catton, say they want one of those three badly, and say they have intel that they're going to get taken, like, ninth or something, if they, like, maybe they use their 2025 Anaheim second, maybe they trade that up with their, like, 11th or 12th, if they package that for, like, two spaces higher, specifically to get one of those guys who, like, realistically should be going in the top five or six in my opinion but falls because oh maybe they're a little shorter maybe a little smaller whatever if they do something like that i could get behind it i don't think i use that that uh late florida first though unless it's like to get someone like that who they use a little bit of intel to know that they're gonna maybe won't fully slip to them at 10th or 12th or wherever they end up so right but like pretty much like I don't think I want to see like a big trade up. If I if I want to see a trade, I want to see it for like one of those value picks, like Benson would have been. Like last year, if they had gotten right. Benson, like that would have been huge because you're getting a guy who, to pretty much everyone on Twitter, seemed like knew Benson should have gone before 13th overall, but he fell to 13th, and now we see him killing it in Buffalo in the NHL immediately. I think, I think like, that was that was the year before, wasn't it? No. Yes. Or was that ben, Benson was just about? last season? Yeah, Benson was um, last year. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of uh, when they traded the the pick for um, Ristolainen. Oh um, yeah. Lost, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's no. Right. Sorry. Benson that, luckily 13. that draft wasn't that great, but you know. Yeah. 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 Well, it, it, I mean, um, it's horrible. First round pick is a first round pick, but I mean that right. draft was you know not yeah. great. Yeah, no, that draft. So was yeah, good. so if at the top, that draft was pretty good through like fifteen. 
I don't know. That was 2021, that. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 2021 was not great through the 15, but we'll continue. Yeah. So if, if they get someone like that and that's the trade up they're doing, I can get behind it. Because then you're getting a player who should go much higher, but is falling for reasons. And that's that to me would be valuable. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it. And I don't think I would trade up higher than like seventh, really. Like, I, I wouldn't take. I wouldn't think it'd be worth the value of trading up any higher than that. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it just depends on where they fall and everything. And then obviously you have the other pick. I still think that there could there could be another first round pick in play, um, if they try to maybe. acquire one at the draft. Maybe. Um, or maybe they they do something and trade up what they did last year and try to get another second. Yeah. I don't know. It it, it it's interesting. I think there's a lot of a lot of uncertainty with that. Uh, any yeah. thoughts, Nick? I mean, like, yeah, I, I don't think the value would be there. It, like Will was saying, if you're trading up to, like, the top four, like, those value, like, unless it's for those top four, like, value picks, um, I wouldn't do it. I'd just pick at 10 and say if they pick at 20, or, like, if they fall at 10 and 22, I'd be making those picks. But um, I would ask you something, Nick. Yeah. If, if, you can trade up into the top three or four and you obviously you'd give up your own pick at, you know, 10, 12, wherever, but then you yeah. can package maybe a, a lower pick with a guy that you already know isn't going to fit here long-term or you feel like you isn't going to fit like maybe a, you know, a frost or whoever the organization would see that, you know, isn't going to be a long-term fit. Would you do yeah. that? Yeah. Um, if it came down to trading, like, Say if they're trading from, like, 10th up to, like, I don't know, this is fantasy booking at its finest, but if they trade from, like, 10th to, like, 3, and you're packaging the 10th overall pick a second, Mm -hmm. and, like, Frost or, like, a guy like Frost or... You're hurting, you're breaking my heart. Even (laughs) Brink, right? Like, Brink, I, I love Bobby Brink. Love Bobby. But it's Brink. a surplus. I don't drag Bob don't. into this. Uh-oh. <laughs> it's I not don't. Bob's fault. I, I did nothing it's not wrong. Bob's fault. It's not. He didn't do anything wrong. But I don't think that I get the vibe that he's going to be a victim of circumstance here in Philly. Right. Like so he I, just becomes expendable. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because you already have those scoring wingers that you have when it comes to like Tippett and Konechny and I'm especially. Yeah. yeah, and and especially on the right I'm, side I'm too. Certain, yeah, the right side. I'm starting to look at Cates as well, right? Like, Cates is another guy that I've been looking at. That like, I'm like, okay, do they really need? Like, is he gonna be here long term, or what are they doing? I think yeah. it's kind of similar with like, Cates is on the fourth line, making a little bit more than Hathaway, and I think Hathaway is more of more of an effective fourth liner than Cates is. Mm-hmm. I think at least, especially within the order right now, I think it's pretty clear that they hold Hathaway to a very high standard. Um, yeah. Why have both of them when you can just have one? I think would be it's the same. I argument. think the, the thing is, it's the same conversation with Paling. Yeah. Like if you if you resign yeah, Paling, but, why would we still have Lawton? Yeah, I mean, well, maybe that's, that's, that could be like, the same thing with Cates. It's like, why be a tough, I mean, like everybody. Like when they re signed Paling, everyone was like, Oh, this is the writing on the wall for Scott Lawton in Philadelphia. Like Lawton's gonna be gone at the deadline, Lawton's gonna get traded, they're gonna and then they didn't end up trading him. I think mm-hmm. that, you know, and Danny said he, he's valuable, they weren't gonna give him away for cheap. They wanted a first and whatever else that they wanted, and they stood firm on that. And like I get standing firm on asking prices and I get playing poker with everybody else in the league, but eventually you're going to get to a point where keeping a bunch of guys because you hold their, their value higher than what it could be and what it should be. You're going to run into surpluses like this. And then people are going to start not I'd getting the playing have time. A surplus though. A hundred percent. Don't get me like a hundred percent, but for some guys, though, I think it, it's unnecessary. Like the amount of wingers that they have between right. the Laurier yeah. and Hathaway and yeah. Atkinson, Wing- and yes. Atkinson, like 
I, I've been seeing a lot of people on Twitter being like, oh, what are, like, are they going to buy out Cam? I don't think that they're going to buy out Cam Atkinson. I think Torts just loves him too much. And it sucks because he's been having such a down year after coming back off an injury that, right. you know, you really have to start asking these questions of, you know, do they buy him out? Do they let him run? What it like? I think part of the one thing with me is that I can't complain about a GM like Briere holding a guy to a certain – you know, certain price when Chuck Fletcher would just trade anything. No, Chuck exactly. Fletcher, you know what I mean? Like it was, I mean, it was that for a while where it was like, it just felt like, like some guys just had no value. You know, it, it felt like Claude Drew yeah. to an extent didn't even have value. Cause it yeah. was like, we traded more, we traded more roster players in that deal than any other trade that, that Chuck made. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it was like, and and, 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 and I think that's kind of my thing is like, you know, I, I'm fine with Breer holding a price because, a, it's worked, and B, you know they they have to they have to do something. Uh, I wouldn't put it in the chat here. The Flyers have to re-sign Brink, Garyanov, Johnson, Stahl, Jennings, Zamula, and Fedotov. I can already tell you right now that Brink, Jennings, Zamula, and Fedotov are the four guys that'll probably be with the Flyers next year. I can't see Garyanov, Johnson, or Stahl. Um, and Paul, I think even to your extent, we talked about this in our Discord on Garyanov. Tord says. Yeah, he's definitely going to get a look. And then he plays four Ariana. fucking games. Yeah, he plays four games. <laughs> yeah. They, like, yeah, no, he's he's been here for, I think, 15 or 16 now, and he's played four of them. So, yeah, it's, and the first it's not one a was good... a 7 nothing game in, in Tampa. And that was right. over not even 10 minutes in. So And I, that was a deal that I was kind of scratching my head at, too. Like, I get really? bringing in veteran presence, but, like, in the same stretch of that, like – I just and it's more of hindsight that I'm scratching my head at it now because yeah. he has played four games over the last fifteen years. But they didn't give up anything though. No, but they yeah, didn't. no, they they didn't give up anything. But I was kind of, like I was kind of scratching my head, being like, is he gonna be cracking the line regularly? Like, what what are we doing? Well, like, but I think at that point, it's it's kind of like almost the coaching staff has to put him in a position to succeed because he yeah. played four games and one of them was the Tampa blowout. So yeah. it's like it's at a certain point you have to give a guy a look. And I think in the games that he's played, I don't think he's played bad. The issue is the team has been so underwhelming in every game that he's played that it's like, all right, well, you can't, you don't really notice him. But there has yeah. been plays where I, I think it was his first game. Didn't he ring one off the off the post? Uh, I was just, yeah, I was just about to bring that up. Like, he's I got think some the good speed. Yeah, you he's know, one he's of the quickest good skaters. He's fast, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't he know. Might, it's, it's interesting. He, he might be one of the best skaters, and like not. That he might be one of the smoothest skaters in the forward group. Yeah. But definitely. Like, you know, he he's a guy as well. I'm kinda like, okay, like he's not gonna be here long term. Yeah. Right. Like I don't know. Yeah. All right. So um we, the Flyers also did make a sign and they signed Oscar Eklund uh to a one year ELC. Um forward playing for H G seventy one in Sweden. Uh, he's twenty five, six foot four, two hundred ten pounds, he had twenty eight points. In 48 games played, uh, 17 goals, 11 assists. It's interesting. I think that also kind of clears up the Guriano thing as well. Like, I think if they're signing a guy like that, yeah, he seems like a guy that could play in the bottom six. That's that's interesting too. Uh, the NHL currently is drafting two versions of a 2024 25 schedule one with the Coyotes and then one with the Coyotes in Salt Lake City. That's really interesting. Uh, the Coyotes are, I, I think, with Salt Lake City. It seems like they're pretty much ready to go. Like I remember a couple years ago when Thirty Two Thoughts, uh, Jeff Merrick and, and Elliot Freeman, they had Ryan Smith on, the guy who owns the Jazz and that building and all that, and he basically said like they're ready. Like they were ready then. Like I can imagine they're probably more ready now. Like they have an arena, they can do it with the cut with, with the Jazz arena. I think I think that he did say it would be a little bit smaller um, because it's it's fit for basketball and it would be less it would probably be i think around like sixteen thousand seat wise so a couple thousand less than than a typical nhl arena that's like nine nineteen to, to twenty twenty k um but yeah no i mean that's uh that's interesting any thoughts on on the coyotes and their really apparent move to uh go into uh salt lake city maybe what do you call that team if they go to salt lake because well, it if it's a real location, they're going to be the Coyotes. I, I don't know, man. Because I when, when, they're when, not going to rename them if it's a real the location. The Thrashers relocated to Winnipeg and they became the Jets again. 
Right, because they they switched teams though. Like it yeah, wasn't I mean, it I, wasn't like that was just like they got a roster and shit. Like this was yeah, like they got I mean, you know what I mean? Like I don't know. I don't know. I think, I think it's if, if they're moving to Salt Lake, I think we it's have any name ideas. Any name ideas? I, 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 mean, I was I was kind of feeling like the Salt Lake City Saints, but like that's just me. I like I that a lot. Like that a lot. Yeah. I think with the so for one thing, I'm in favor of Salt Lake City. Most of these could new. Like I don't know, it's cool. And the, the Coyotes I'm in Arizona. Tired of Coyotes. Is, is anyone yeah. else just tired of them? Like yeah, yeah. it's well, just like, it's like every year we have this conversation. I'm not the Coyotes. I think their brand is good enough, and and is one of the better brands I think in the league. To be honest, in terms of logos, color design, like Social I wouldn't want to see it. Needs. What? Yeah, like I wouldn't want to see it entirely go. So maybe they keep like the Kachina, but then maybe they rebrand to like slightly different or they keep the coyotes, but then maybe change the colors or like, I, I could see them changing some of it with the salt Lake city move, but not all of it. Um, um, I would, I would say that to stay the, the coyotes though. That'd be my prediction. Unpopular opinion. Hmm. I like the coyote head that they had more than I do the Kachina. I do Me too. and Chris were just talking about that the other day. We both like uh, the old like, coyote head. Uh, everybody I've talked to is like, no, old coyote or the Kachina is the best one. I'm like, no, the old yeah. coyote head I, I like the best. Yeah, I mean, I thought the I was just a big fan of the the kind of like maroon jerseys that they had. Yeah, mm-hmm. I thought they I'd looked be in really big clean. favor. I'd be in big favor of if they are going to relocate. If you want to do like a rebrand in a sense if you brought that back i'd be i'd be majorly up for that yeah yeah how about, i like uh, that red better yeah yeah mm-hmm. like, like the kind yeah, of in between I, of like a bright red and maroon like right. i don't like the red wings like bright red like i feel like every and like the canes like i don't like that bright red mm-hmm. i think they're old mm-hmm. with the the coyote head jersey i thought they yeah. did that red really well where it was like bright yeah. but not too bright i, I thought that was amazing mm-hmm let me let yeah. me just run through a list of names here real quick, and I want I want okay. to get you guys' reaction to this. The Golden Eagles. Well, I, I'd I'd say just the Eagles, no. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Salt Lake yeah. Eagles. Even even that, I'm not a big fan of. Well, there's the already an NHL team that's the Eagles. That's true. Yeah, the Colorado Eagles. Yep. The uh the Grizzlies. Yeah. No, there's an no. NBA two, team in Memphis. Two, and two typical, I think. No. No. Pioneers, just, no. 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 How about the uh, – this is coming from a Salt Lake resident, by the way. So I guess this is, like, in his opinion, what he would, you know, go with. Maybe the bees, the buzz, uh, stingers. I'm not a fan of any of these. I'm not going to lie. I don't see the I fit like in Salt one. Lake City with the names. Like, what does Salt Lake City have from a name perspective that's really going to be cool? A lot cool of people buying houses. Yeah, right. The prospectors. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Hell, yeah. Salt Lake uh, prospectors. I'm- it's it's a very winter ish state, yeah. so yeah, you can't do the Avs. No. Um, the Blizzard. I really I mean, liked what like, Nick said about the Saints. Like, I think even Saints just drop up. city, the Salt Lake yeah. Saints would go hard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could do that. I just, I still think I, I just keep it the Coyotes. To be honest, I would do Probably. the Coyotes. I, yeah, but I, mean, I, would, I would. Okay, I would do Coyotes. But did you guys see the um? The one like slight color rebrand of their logo that put in like some light blue, no. like instant maroon. No, no but uh, you know what? I might have seen that actually because it the was, light. It was like a. It was almost like a teal, right? Yeah, it was like basically instead of maroon and like green, they did like a kind of like a Sabers blue and yeah. like the Winnipeg Jets light blue from their um like ret- one of their retro jerseys. Right. It did those, and I thought that was really cool. So I would I would probably say keep the coyotes, keep most of their like pattern and design the same, but maybe yeah. throw in a new color or, or rework the colors a bit. Um I think that'd be my my personal vote. Um yep. but the the Saints, the Salt Lake Saints would be cool. That so yeah. that does have a ring to it. I don't know what the logo would be or like what the how much of a rebrand that would there. entail. I wonder but, if they could tie in the Kachina with the Saint. Yeah, type of I, I like the Kachina pattern. Hockey. I think they got to yeah. keep that. Yeah. Yeah. Because 
you, you can't deny that it is, it is one of the best NHL jerseys. But at the same time, yeah. yep. it's just a branding thing. I don't think you can hold it to that high of a standard, especially if you're moving an entire franchise. I just think I just think the one thing to their to their credit is the Kachina like screams desert to me. Which, when you're going to Salt Lake, like I don't know how much you can tie that into it. I mean, yeah, you you kind of have a limit with the Kachina. I feel like, but um, yeah, I mean, if they if they do happen to relocate, I think it's impressive that they'd be able to do such a turnaround where they play games there next year. I mean, that's that's quite the uh, <laughs> that's quite the turnaround in in just mm-hmm. less than a year yeah. that they're already. Really, they don't have to do a ton. Honestly, if that's the case, I, mean, I I guess not. But like, I don't know. It's the type of thing that I feel like would already be announced by now for them if if they were going there this fall. Well, they they did say April eighteenth, so it's about a week. Yes, yeah, Sarah Valley did report that it could have been April eighteenth. But I mean, and that's in that's pretty much almost in eight just days. over a week now. Yeah, eight mm-hmm, days. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with that. I mean, I don't know. I, I it would suck to see the Coyotes I, out of I, Arizona I, because it's a cool hockey market. But yeah, at the same I, time, I think it's yeah, a good like, sports market too. Like yeah. you got the Diamondbacks, you got the Cardinals. Like Arizona, it, it's like I, it, it's a good town. Like I think there's a, there's a lot of stuff to do there. Um, it's good with, I mean, weather is it's, it's hot, but it's pretty good weather state. Yeah. Um, you know, I think and and it's not it's not a horrible distance either. I don't think for like a lot of travel and everything too. If you do play there, I mean, yeah, you are in Mallet Arena and all that, and, and it's definitely going to be different. I think, but I just think it's just like. I just think the NHL has to move on. It, it, it's like it just feels like there's always the it's like a weight on their shoulders, pretty much. Yeah, and, and there's yeah. always like the negative connotation that always comes with the Coyotes. That it's like, yeah, you know. So I, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd move on at this point. I wonder. I just thought of this now. I wonder if it's possible that they could be viewing this as kind of like a test. Like, what if they say, like, "Hey, we're building a new Coyotes arena in Tempe, Arizona." And it's going to take three years. In the meantime, the Coyotes are going to play in Salt Lake, right? So they have an, a full NHL arena that, or a more than mullet, right? And maybe then they even view that as a sort of test for the Salt Lake market. Yeah, they almost test and, the market, yeah. And then, and then they, if it works, if it's working there in Salt Lake, they then bring in a new team to Salt Lake and let's say um, Houston. It's an interesting thought I just thought of now, and it could kind of explain why they would be considering playing games in Salt Lake and making mm-hmm. a schedule there without us having heard anything. Cause it wouldn't be like a major move. It'd be more of like a temporary move to solve the arena problem. So that, that could be an interesting, that, that, that's something I just thought of now that, actually yeah. seems probable from my limited knowledge of all the background stuff that would go on with that. But um that could be a really interesting idea. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, I don't know. I mean it's interesting, but we'll uh yeah. I mean we'll have to see what happens. I think I think there's there, there's gonna be a lot of flow and stuff that comes up with that, especially the next couple of days if that's coming on the eighteenth. So we'll see. All right. So uh we're gonna take a pause, uh, Nick. Thank you so much for joining us, man. We really do appreciate it. Always enjoy, me, uh, you know, yeah. hearing your insight. You got any last thoughts, my guy? Um, I think everybody needs to realize that as much as they overperformed, and as much as the team exceeded expectations, it's still early. They're still not ready to compete at that high of a level for a full 82 game season stretches like this were bound to happen. It's just the timing of it is pretty shitty. And so um, it'll, yeah. it'll, yeah, <laughs> it'll <laughs> work <laughs> out. It'll work out in the end. I think Fido- or Fedotov coming over is a huge win for them, especially after losing Carter. Um, I think them getting Fedotov sets them on the right track gets them accelerated a little bit because now you don't have to wait for Kolosov for another few years. Mm-hmm. Yep. And they're not as far away as what most people thought. And I think it'll take another year or two to get it settled and figured out and get Mechkov over. And But there's still, like, there's hope, Flyers fans. Yep. 
there is hope and there's a lot of it. Thank nice. you guys for having me on. Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Nick. Give us a break from Sam. Hell yeah. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So thank you to Nick uh, for joining us. Really good insight. Uh, we're going to kind of round up the pod with some questions. Uh, we're we're going to do it in a different way. We have a call in line now. Uh, 267-939-1216 if you're listening or watching. Yes, give sir. us a call for the next episode. Uh, we have a voice Before we get into the question, we, to, got a, uh, we got another new face here. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was just getting there. Uh, oh, were you? Yeah, no, yes, I was. Okay. But we got, uh, well, we got Owen. Uh, Producer Owen's going to be joining yeah. us for the uh, the call segment. Um, and Sam's replacements have been passed around like a block today. We got three faces in that corner. <laughs> yeah, that's good. There you go. All right, uh, let's kind of get into this. I'll play the first one, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, so listen in, boys. What's up, Chris? I'm just reaching out about the Flyers' current situation. I see a bunch of kids consistently saying, oh, yeah, lose the last four games, forfeit, we'll have a 3% chance at the lottery. That's fucking ridiculous. That's absolutely absurd. If this team doesn't go balls to the wall for the last four games, then that's when I don't become a fan anymore. We are one point out of the spot. If that doesn't excite you, like please stop watching. Go Flyers. It's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's mic scary. drop right there. I'm gonna go I balls to the wall, drop. boys. Yeah. No, seriously, any any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I by all means they shouldn't sell these last games. Yeah. They I have to try to win every game. Well, they can still fucking they're... make it is the craziest part, but yeah, they can yeah. still do it. That being said, truthfully, if they don't make the playoffs, it is best for the team to have the best draft position. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll slightly disagree, but not entirely. Obviously, I want them to win these games. I want them to try to win these games. But the the two ideal scenarios are either they win the next three and make the playoffs, or they lose the next three and maybe draft 10th overall. But, you know, that's we don't get to – by all means, I don't want them to try and lose. I want them to try and win all these games. Um, so, yeah, so we'll see. Um, hopefully they at least don't embarrass themselves in these next few games regardless. These yeah. last games haven't been enjoyable to watch, and I personally don't want to be miserable these last three games of Flyers hockey this season, assuming they don't make the playoffs. So at the very least, let's hope they make it interesting. Anyone yeah, else have I, on that? yeah, I just I think I talked about this a little bit in uh, an article that that was published uh, earlier this week, or um, or was it last week? Yeah, it was um, earlier this week. Earlier this week that the Flyers have put themselves in a really good position to give this. It's a really young team, and give that young team the opportunity to compete in meaningful games, whether or not those are in the playoffs doesn't super duper matter. I mean, obviously you'd prefer to make the playoffs and give the team playoff experience, but meaningful regular season games are just as important to get you there in the first place. So I really, I'm with him. You kind of got to go all in here and try to win games. You don't want them to just kind of throw in the towel. Like they kind of appear to be doing um, to some people, but yeah, I I also don't think it would be the worst thing in the world for them to lose and get a better draft position. So I, I think I kind of agree with Will where, you know, best case scenario, they went out and make the playoffs. Worst case scenario, they maybe win a couple, don't make the playoffs. But, hey, that's still a pretty good situation to be in. You're giving the team meaningful experience. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, I think for me, I'm, you know, if you can make it, get in. If not, it is what it is. I'm, I'm kind of over the – I, I've let loose the emotional feeling behind it, um, so I don't know. It 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 just sucks that we're even having this conversation. But yeah, it does. It does. Uh, yeah. Send it over to the uh, next one. Here it is. So I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would say the Flyers, for the most part, are all but mathematically eliminated. I'm just going to give you my thoughts on the season as a whole. Yes, it sucks that they're going to miss out. I mean, only a couple weeks ago, we were all optimistic, pretty confident that they were getting in. But as a whole, I still think this has been a successful season. I mean, number one, 
I personally like the direction the team is going. I trust in Briere and Jones to bring us the players that we need to take that next step. Number two, I think this is a baby step in the growth process. I mean, you got to crawl before you walk. And maybe now they realize how tough it is this time of the year to win games. I mean, the intensity gets ratcheted up. Every shift means a little bit more. It should serve as a great motivation for next year coming so close and missing out. And third, uh, again, as far as the organization goes, I think they've done a better job of PR with the fans. Uh, I mean, definitely room, in my opinion, for growth and optimism. Tough ending, but overall, I call it a solid year. Yeah, and that's from uh, that's from longtime listener Sean Fitzpatrick. Uh, yeah. Anyway, Sean, any uh, any thoughts there? But I I, th- I think it's a good good comment. Like I think definitely you know yeah they you know they they definitely made some strides this year. Um, do I think it was perfect? No, obviously because the way that that this epic shitstorm you know kind of came along. But I think it's definitely worth noting. Yeah, I mean I think one of the things he mentioned there was the PR that's another thing that they kind of worked hard on to to uh I guess patch up I think you know there was a lot of leaks coming out a couple years ago Mm -hmm. from within the org there was just a clear disconnect from the fan base and and management and all the higher ups yeah spelling names wrong forgetting your founder's birthday you know the classic stuff that you usually see um that's definitely been fixed uh and and on ice you know I mean on ice is, is definitely taking a step forward too it's tough when you have such a young team to kind of take steps at such a at such strong intervals. Like you know, we've seen Buffalo. I mean, they've been trapped in hell for what fourteen years now. I mean, they've they've rebuilt about three times and haven't been able to take that next step. So it's it's not an easy thing to do. And the fact that this team came that close to doing it is impressive. And I think it's just a telltale sign that they'll be doing it within the next year or so. And especially when they get more talent and they keep developing the younger players, it's just going to progressively get better. So I definitely think it was a good start. You'd like to get a uh, higher draft pick. Maybe if, you know, they lose a couple more games, not on purpose, obviously, but if it happens, then so be it. All right. So that's all we got. Uh, thanks everybody again uh, for all the support as always. Make sure to check out Mayor Media and obviously Four Fly Guys and all the things that we do over here uh, and then everyone else at the rest of the company. Anyone got anything uh, fun coming out? Um, well, with the, the recent losses, um, currently working on a, um, a really early preliminary um, ranking for this upcoming draft. Um, cool. I feel like that should be – originally I was going to wait because given the Flyers are making the playoffs, it just didn't feel like it, it – it just didn't feel like it had a place. But now, it, I mean, I think we're all kind of paying a little more attention to the draft now. Um, yeah. And – whatever that list is and whenever i come up finally finish that article which got largely in place just need to do some final touches um should be some interesting names there that we could be probably seeing or hearing called by danny Breer come draft day so stay tuned for that yeah yeah that'll be a good read for uh phi pipeline speaking of which we'll definitely yeah. have some uh i know I'll, I'll probably be uh kind of looking at the um the phantoms assuming they hold on to this spot and make a, make a playoff run. I'm definitely going to be covering that. Um, maybe uh, catch a game or two in person. If they make it to the second round, uh, that, that should be uh, hopefully something to look forward to. Maybe, maybe one of the teams will, will decide to uh, get the shit together and make it, but we'll yeah. see. Um, me and Paul had this get back, uh, yeah. What's that? I said, me and Paul had this exact conversation outside of his house, yeah. like one o'clock in the morning the other night. Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. We were like, yep. What are the chances we think we can go to a Phantoms playoff game? <laughs> no, nope. kind of mapping on that. Yeah. But yeah, no. I mean, everyone's been doing a lot of stuff, and um, you know, I think Pipeline will be dope. And like, again, like Paul said, if we could cover Phantoms games and you know for the playoffs in in person, that'll be sweet. So, yep. yeah, yeah. Well, uh, kind of see what happens. Paul, do you got anything else coming out or anything like that? Not planned right this second. Just a lot of editing, a lot of uh, kind of brainstorming for what we have coming up, and uh, yeah, it should be fun. I mean. After this kind of the last three games wrap up, we'll have a whole summer to uh, 
you know, focus on, on obviously the brand, but also the team covering everything and the draft is coming up. So that'll be, uh, yeah, that'll be fun. Cool. Owen. Yeah. Uh, I mean, besides stitching together this, uh, this podcast with duct tape and safety scissors, uh, <laughs> you know, just, just keep an eye out for more four fly guys stuff coming up in the next, uh, in, in next week. Um, we're going to recap the season. Um, you know, once, uh, once they either limp into the playoffs or, uh, completely miss it. Um, hopefully we'll be talking about the Phantoms on four fly guys. If they make the playoffs, um, a lot of cool drafts up coming up. You know, we got a lot of really fun plans for four fly guys this summer. Um, yep. a couple of really cool guests that we have in the pipeline coming down, not, not the PHI pipeline, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just keep an eye out guys. Cool. Yeah. And then I have some stuff coming for, for uh, PHI heritage as well. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be a lot yep. of fun. And, uh, yeah. Thanks everybody again. For all support, as always, we'll talk to you guys all again next week. See you guys. Yeah!